evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Amanda Krauss, and I'm the founder and CEO of Row New York. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Special thanks to Liz Gilbert and Arshe Cooper for being here. Um, I have the absolute pleasure of introducing these two and their talk back about Arshay's film tonight, A Most Beautiful Thing. I'm assuming most of you have watched it, but if you haven't, please do so. It's based on Arshay's memoir by the same name. Um, it was produced by Mary Mazio, and it chronicles the experience of America's first all-Black high school rowing team. Um, I want to send a quick thanks to all of the people who were able to make a donation to Row New York as a part of the screening tonight. For those of you who don't know, Row New York is a New York City-based nonprofit that brings competitive rowing and academic support to a really diverse and incredible group of young people in New York City. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with Arshe as a board member uh, at Row New York and as a member of a, our staff. I consider myself extra lucky to also call him a friend. Um, to know Arshe is certainly to love him. His heart and energy and his humor are really unparalleled. Uh, he is a, a, a rower, a husband, a father, an award-winning author, um, a motivational speaker. He's won many accolades in the sport of rowing for his work on diversity in rowing. Um, and my favorite time that I get to spend with Arshe by far uh, is when I get to see him at the Row New York Boathouses interacting with kids because I feel like Arshe captures all that we want for all of our young people, which is someone who um, who shows up and listens and cares and asks questions and tells stories and um, continues to celebrate our young people. So um, Arshe, thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing your story with all of us. Um, Liz Gilbert probably needs no introduction. Um, <laughs> But just in case, she is a best-selling author of nine books, including Eat, Pray, Love, Big Magic, Creative Living Beyond Fear, and most recently, a really great one, City of Girls. Liz is also a rower, um, but probably more importantly in my mind, she's an invaluable friend to Row New York. Uh, she's not only a huge supporter of our programs for our kids, but she's endlessly generous with her time and her energy, including joining us here tonight. She um, you know, there's very little she won't do to support our young people, and we're so grateful to her. Uh, and I can't think of two better people to be spending my Saturday night with. Um, so down to business now. You can submit your questions in the chat function on the right side of the screen, and um, the moderators will pass them along. Uh, we may not get to all of them, but we'll try to get through as many as we can. And now um, I'm going to turn this over to Liz and to Arshe, and thank you both so much for doing this. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, we'll get right into it. Arshe, movie is so exquisite, it's so beautiful. And I think like many of us, I, I finished it with tears rolling down my face, fired, um, amazed by the story, moved. And I wanted to ask you, um, I guess I wanted to ask you, begin by asking you a very simple fundamental question, which is why rowing? What is it about rowing that you think has the potential to be so transformative in people's lives? Um, in your book of the same name, uh, A Most Beautiful Thing, you talked about how when you were in high school and the kids on the football team, the basketball team knew that you guys were rowing, they would mock you. Nobody had ever heard of the sport. It didn't, it didn't get you any girls. It didn't get you. Any girls. Um, and, and one of the, in fact, one of the athletes said to you, um, you're, you, you don't exist, you know, basically like as, as somebody doing this sport, you don't exist. And, and I want to know what your feeling is about that, um, about how rowing exists in your imagination and what it can do and be for people. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Uh, there's a couple answers to that. Um, number one, um, when Ken came to our school and talked about the sport, there was so much missing in my life and, and, and so many things I wanted to accomplish, but was afraid to. And I've never been anywhere. So when he said, Rowan gives you the opportunity to, to travel as a high school student, I was like, wow. Then he said, you will learn how to swim. I was like, wow. You know? And then he said, you will build a brotherhood. And that's something I didn't have. That was the first thing that really caught my attention. And to be a part of the sport and to have a group of guys that show up every day not for cheerleaders, 
not for a million dollar contract one day after college, um, not for a busload of fans, not for a pep rally, but for themselves and the person who sits in front of you and behind you, and they're willing to break their backs and rip apart their hands every day was something that I needed so badly in my life because I only had one friend in high school. And so that was the first thing that was just um, uh, awesome in my life. And the second thing is that I tried out for football and I hated the way it made me feel. You know, the coach was like, knock them dead. And I was like, no, I don't want to hurt nobody. Like, I, I'm, I, that's not in my nature. And I, then I would go try out for the basketball team. And when you playing basketball, it's a lot of trash talk. Like you suck, you garbage. And these were words that I heard all the time growing up from teachers and from people in the neighborhood. So it didn't make me feel good about myself. And then finally, I team up with these guys who didn't get along at first. We're pushed out into open water. And I'm sitting there with these guys from different gangs and different neighborhoods. And we had to be tough at Manly because it was such a, a violent school and you had to protect yourself. And that was the first time I was able to see fear in all the guys. We smelled fear in each other. And we knew at that point, in order to get back to the dock, to not drown, that we had to pull for each other. We had to sit tall. We had to breathe. We had to pay attention and we had to listen and we had to trust each other and follow each other. And when that happened, there's only one sound. And that comes from the coxswain or from the coach. And those were the words, breathe, relax on the slide, drive. Don't rush the slide. You can do this. You're amazing. You belong here. You have a right to be here. And those words that was spoken into our lives two hours a day in a place that was beautiful. The water, that was, it was my first time even downtown and seeing that view. And it was like, you know, like in the shower, you finally get to uh, collect your thoughts or when you're near the ocean, you're calm or when there's a rainstorm, you, you're locked in. And it felt like that every day on the water, just the magical rhythm and the blade, the sound of the blade hitting the water was pure meditation. And it, storm, it calmed the storm in me. And every day after practice, I, was, I just wanted to like follow and love or go to sleep. And it was just awesome for our spirits. And, and that's when I fell in love. You depict that so beautifully in the film about, um, you know, the guys are saying that there's something like spiritual and holy. It's a place of peace to be on the water. And there's a line in your book where you say, um, it's amazing what beauty can do to drive out fear, um, like just natural beauty, which was obviously something that, that you guys were really starved of in the neighborhood. Um, one of the things I love about what Row New York is doing right now is they're building a truly beautiful boathouse for the community um, that's as beautiful as it humanly can be because of the belief that like these kids deserve to have something really beautiful. They don't deserve to just see squalor every single day. They get to see majesty and grandeur and and I think you communicated that really beautifully about what the, what the water does to the spirit. Um, when you spoke about the violence of football and the violence and the competitiveness of basketball, and you said that the coach, the football coach said, you know, go get them, kill them, knock them dead. You know, my heart, <laughs> heart stopped it because one of the things that's so devastating about this story is the amount of actual trauma of death and killing and violence that you had already seen as a young child and that all the kids that you grew up with had already seen. I was so glad in the movie that you spoke about the lasting devastating intergenerational um, trials of, of, of combat. Of, I, I said combat, but it is combat, of living in, in those kind of neighborhoods. And you said uh, from your book, at 14 years old in my neighborhood, kids had already experienced what most soldiers went war. And you speak in the film about how um, kids from neighborhoods like yours have 10% higher rates PTSD than most veterans returning. I was wondering if you could speak about trauma, um, what you've learned about it, how you think um, the sport can help it, where you see it um, causing the destruction in the neighborhoods, anything. Yeah, um, I think number one, I, I remember even like every time there was a mass shooting in these suburban neighborhoods, they right away sent in all these trauma counselors after. 
And I thought that was important. But I remember saying, man, we experienced that every day and never seen anyone. There were no trauma counselors. There were no social workers. I went through a life of skipping through pools of blood and, and running from the sounds of bullets. So hearing gunshots when I sleep and experiencing that every day. And me and my friends will tell you, the guys in the boat, that we have never talked to anyone about it, never seen anyone about it. And I think what hit me even more is the fact that my grandmother, who's very old but alive and well, uh, who picked cotton in the South, when her and my grandfather seen a friend hung on a tree. Also Malcolm, mom's brother was hung on a tree. The trauma, the violence, or running from KK, KKK guys with their rifles have caused a lot of trauma in their lives. They have never seen anyone or talked to anyone about, and they all ran from the South to get away and was placed in one place where no resources and couldn't get loans because of the color of their skin, couldn't take out a mortgage. They were redlined. Um, and at the time they called the neighborhood in Chicago, the black belt, which means all the people migrated from the South and, and, um, and, and they really was in a community that was neglected and mistreated in ways that, and to deal with that trauma, a lot of my grandfather drank a lot of alcohol to deal with the violence that he saw and that he had to endure. And my mom had to pay for his trauma. And she was never able to see anyone. There was no resources to talk to anyone, to see anyone. And, and, and then early on, I had to deal with some of her trauma. And that passes on. And it's so important when, you know, that important part of the film, Pooh said, Pooh said in the barbershop, he said, that when they closed down the YMCA's, I ran to the streets. And the YMCA's were the places where you get to finally talk to a mentor or a coach or play basketball and have conversations around gang activity or what you was going through at home. But they were being shut down because there were no resources. And um, so it, that was important to speak about because every day, every day till this day, our young people are going through that. And they're also afraid to talk to anyone. I didn't want to talk to anyone about it. And, and, and I tell young people all the time that it, it doesn't mean you're crazy to see someone. You just can't unsee what you saw. And I couldn't either. So it's always encouraging them to understand that the world is the way it is, especially on the west side of Chicago. It's because of slavery, because of Jim Crow laws, because of segregation, and because of the neglect that, that is there and, and people were, were, were just trying to survive. And that's something that didn't make it to the film, but the guys talked about in the barbershop is the missing fathers and grandfathers, right? Who in the 60s were thrown in jail or was a part of the Black Panthers party and was killed to, uh, for that movement and got out of jail and couldn't get work because they had a record. And it all contributed to uh, the poverty in our neighborhood and and you would do whatever it takes to survive to protect your family and 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 drugs to spread in our community and, and and people took that to cope so there's some deep rooted issues that that we really wanted to touch on and um and and now what we're doing now is is working right now we're working with members of congress to um to hopefully uh, work with trauma specialists to get their get, to get uh, forgiveness for their loans so they can go into these schools uh, and, and work with some of uh, these young people and to offer the sport of rowing, right? I didn't, I wasn't able to see anyone, but I was able to release. And right there in that water with those guys, when we were alone at the regatta, the only blacks around, we were able to talk to each other and receive healing from each other and for the mentors that we had. When you speak about receiving healing from your mentors. Um, and I just wanted to say, everybody, I understand my sound is coming and going. Um, forgive me. It's it's my fault. It's my Wi-Fi. <laughs> Stay with me. Um, we'll do our best. Um, <laughs> important person's voice to hear is Arshay's. <laughs> but uh, you speak about how the right person at the right time showing up in a young person's life can transform their life. Um, you talk about Eugene at the boathouse um, showing up and, and giving you the words you needed right at the exact moment. 
and even the the when your mother was using drugs and the guy on the street who handed her a pamphlet to a recovery house these kind of miraculous almost angelic figures who show up in a person's life just at the right moment um, to give them the direction that they need. I wonder if you could speak about um, your experience being one of those people uh, as you've become a mentor, a coach, uh, a speaker. What's it been like for you to be on the other side of that? Uh, it's It's been great. I mean, what I've learned from Eugene and all these people who uh, was a part of my life, a part of the, the, the roadmap uh, to success um, has definitely um, impacted my life. And I knew I had to give back to the, the the place that gave to me. And I learned that from watching black TV shows, like A Different World. There was this character, Dwayne Wade, Dwayne uh, Wayne, and it the show really talks about these black um, amazing people on this college campus who not only went to this college, but all came back to be professors. And I learned that from that TV show, right? And I kind of knew that I want to dedicate my life to, to giving back because the truth of the matter is this. I knew I wanted to be a chef. I knew I wanted to be a culinary chef and a celebrity chef, but also knew that Harriet Tubman career was a union spy, but she's known um, for her freedom, the freedom that she represented. When you think of ML MLK, um, you, you know, he was an educated preacher, but you think about the hope that he brings. Or you think about Gandhi, you don't say, oh, the attorney, you think about the peace that he <laughs> represented. Right. And when you represent something bigger than your career and bigger than yourself, true change happens. So when I roll up in my neighborhood, I, I live in Bronzeville in Brooklyn because I wanted people to see who I am, the success and young people that grew up like I did. I want them to see me and not see an author, a chef or a rower, but I want them to say, that's the hope for my community. And that's important when they build this boathouse at Row, New York, that people can look at that boathouse and say, you know that place? That's the, that's the lighthouse of our community. And, it, it, and that's the place that's changing lives for our parents, for our kids, our kids' kids. And, and, and that, that's always been so important to me because it was given to me and it was important to, to give it back and represent, um, and represent that and, and to every person I encounter, no matter who they are, where they're from, no matter the hand that they hold, the God of their prayers, the color of their skin, that I have to give that love and that hope back. And you're not kidding when you say anybody, because the most shocking moment of this film for me, and I think probably for many of us, <laughs> was when all of a sudden you invited four white cops to come and row with you guys from the west side of Chicago. And, and you had this idea, and I have to admit that, you know, as soon as you presented it, I had the same reaction that your buddies had. I was like, what is he doing? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you made this film a year ago, but at this moment, particularly to watch that and to see these four, four very white, very Chicago, especially Chicago cops, um, come in and and with a great deal of mistrust and suspicion on everybody's side except yours right you were the only person in the room who was relaxed you were the only person in the room who was like this is going to work um so i want to ask you about your inspiration for that i want to ask you what it's like to see that that footage now um when we're dealing with what we're dealing with um in in the realm of, of social justice and police reform and the protests and george floyd's murder um and i want to ask you if you would do it again um, <laughs> 2020 <laughs> no, just um it, would you have the same the same impulse now yeah you know just to say liz i did do this before when i was 19 years old with my homeboys and, and the cops in the backyard barbecue before but that's a different story i um when when i was a kid we it, well in rowan we shared the boathouse with three private schools all white kids and at first never spoke to each other and i was that kid that was outgoing i had to do everything by the books and everything right and I, I volunteered. I worked for free. I, 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 you know, I took the guys to church. I, I, like, I was just that kid. And I went to school every day. We had the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We had to recite the preamble. We had to recite the Declaration of Independence from for for in front of everyone. 
I went to the baseball game as a kid and sang the national anthem with goosebumps up my spine. And yet I have had my face pressed on a police car at least eight times. The first time it happened, I was 12. And the way they would check you in these neighborhoods for drugs, because young people did sell drugs to survive, they would put their hands down your pants. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, to be touched by a stranger starts a riot and anger in you that never really goes away. And I remember saying to myself as a young kid, maybe it's just this way because the West Side has a lot of craziness happening. Mm -hmm. And then I started interacting with the guys at the boat house that don't look like me. And we became friends. And I would go play the vi play video games at, at their place and I would leave their place at eight o'clock, my backpack in suburbia neighborhood or the West Loop. And cops would still pull me over and check my backpack and say, what are you doing over here? Are you stealing? And I realized I was walking in a different America than a, a lot of those guys were. And I remember asking those guys from Loyola Academy, uh, have you ever been pulled over that way or had your face pressed down a police car or went walked into an elevator and, and a woman, white woman hold, held up her so walked past a car or someone popped their lock or maybe just took a rowing trip and went to the gas station. You was only allowed to go in one at a time because they thought you were still. And they haven't. And so the next time I, was able, I went to a baseball game, I was not able to sing the same songs that they was able to sing because I felt like it didn't apply for me. And I had carried that hurt for a long time. So in the process of filming this documentary, everyone was talking about the disconnect of different gangs in different communities. And in the process, I ho said, hold up. The biggest disconnect is not just the different gangs, but it's the black lives and what people call the blue lives. Right. There are guys who, white people who move in our neighborhoods to start a restaurant or a store or a cleaner's business or a teacher. And the first thing they know is that they have to get to know the people in the community. They have to know who Ms. Walker is. They need to know who their kids are and they speak. And then they begin to understand that black lives matter. Then you have white cops who work in these neighborhoods eight hours a day for 15 years. And the only interaction is when they're pulling you over or, um, or when my face is pressed down against the car or when someone is calling them and there's trouble and, and they feel like they have to help in the midst of trouble. And when I sat with the guys, I, believe, I said to them, I believe in education through conversation and they need to know my story and they need to know who you are. They need to know who your kids are. And I can't just mail them my book and they would read it. I can't just hold up a sign and, and, and promise you that they will understand. I can't just march to the police station and, and they will hear my voice. But one thing I do know is that sports unites people. And I wanna bring them to the same water, the same place where we didn't like each other at first and have them listen and open their ear while we teach them and then have a conversation and you know and it's like okay okay and so you know they sh they showed up and i was like they need to know our names they gotta know our names they work in our community they gotta know our names so we were competitive at first just to break the ice it was awkward at first and then we put them in the tanks right and I, and i gave this lesson of to go anywhere in life you have to be moving together you can't do the work of eight people right but you need eight people to do the work and you'll get there much faster right? That we can't do it alone. It takes a village to raise a child. And, and so that happened, right? And I asked, we, we started a conversation. I asked them, I said, I need you guys to make a commitment that when you see a kid on the edge, when you see a kid who grew up like me or Malcolm or Preston, that you can just take them to the boat house. The boat house is free. It's right there in the center of Chicago. And they, they made that commitment, but it wasn't enough. It, just that one day wasn't enough. And I knew in order to break the ice, to break down, to really get a chance to know them, they, need to, they, they needed to train with us. So I invited them out to race. And in that course of training with them and working with them, 
they saw that Preston wears his hoodie and sags his pants, but he's one of the best entrepreneurs on the west side of Chicago. They saw that Malcolm calls his son every 10 minutes, and someone loves these kids that are out there. They saw that Alvin got in trouble, but he is not a criminal, but he's a protector. He's a survivor, and you have to survive. And they had to understand that I have never gotten in trouble, even been suspended, but still been harassed by people who wear the same uniforms that they wear. And that happened through our stretching, through our talking. And the magical moment for me is when the cop was sitting in the boat. He was one Vic Lou. He was very scared. And Alva sat behind him and he said, sit tall. You got this. I've been here. And Alvin took a lot of time with this guy outside of the camera, working with him, working with him. And, um, and so um, we raced, we went to Regatta, we met their kids, they met our kids, they met our moms, we worked with them. And I honestly believe when they pull someone over, they will always think of our face and our story, even if it's only four guys. Because when that happened to Joyce Floyd, when I looked on the TV and I saw a cop look into the camera, put his knee on this guy's neck and slowly kill a man, it brought back that trauma of having my face pressed down the police car. And then that anger and that riot that never goes away, it surfaced. Not just in my life, but many black people out there that is out there marching and angry. It brings back that experience. And the reason why I, thought, I, I said to myself, I'm glad I got through because they all called me. They text me. I was going to ask you, have you yes. heard? Yes, absolutely. And they said, I can't believe this happened. I am so sorry. And this is what I said. You know, I said to, I said to Carol, I said, every day in our neighborhood, you know, there's some violence. But I promise you, there's every, every day there's people who look like me that is fighting to stop it and to offer opportunity. And every time I see a young man who got in trouble, I've worked with gang members before, I'm holding them accountable. That's happening every day. There's racism happening every day. More and more, I see white people standing up and challenging them and hold them accountable. But what I don't see is cops holding their own accountable. What can we do about it? Now, that conversation would happen with just my friends. But now that I can talk to them was the reason why I did it. I just wanted a conversation. And that's, that's my way. Bridge in the Water is my way. In, in the 60s, there were many different movements. There was the MLK movement. There was the NAACP movement. There was Malcolm X movement. There was the Black Panthers movement. There was James Baldwin's movement. But my way is conversation through sports. And, um, and, and that was the hope, hopes and dreams that I had. And, and, I'm, I, and even with Breonna Taylor, hey, this is BS. What's going to happen? I am charging it. What are they going to do? I hope they stand up. And I said in the film, it doesn't change the system, but it's a start. And, um, and, and, and that's why I invited them out. You're amazing, Arshay. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I, that I, I think there's a danger of, um, you're so amazing. Your life is so extraordinary that when I saw the camaraderie that you had created between the police officers and your friends, I had this momentary thought of only Arshay Cooper could pull this off, right? <laughs> only like, this is like, oh really, only Arshay Cooper could do this. But then I realized that's a dangerous thought, Liz, because we actually need everybody to be doing what they can, you know? Um, so like, if I put you on a pedestal and I'm like, God, this is a really miraculous, unusual human being, um, you know, that's not as effective as saying like, what can we do together, you know? Um, and and I, I lost track of how many times in your book and in the film you, you use the word together. I swear if it was a drinking game, <laughs> every time you say together, everybody would have to take a shot. You wouldn't make it through the first half an hour of the film. Like you really believe in togetherness. And, and so I guess I, a question I have for you, a lot of these people are Row New York supporters. A lot of the people who are watching are supporters of rowing um, in general. And, you know, they came to this movie, they came to this night because they were interested in your story. Um, what would be if you could give us an action call um, for something that all of us could do together um, or even individually how you want us to be reacting? Because this feels to me 
like a very critical moment in American history. Um, and and we're standing on the edge of maybe what could be big change. So I'm I'm just curious um, if you have a if you had a wish um, for for all of us, what would it be? Yeah, it, it's it's probably more than one wish, but uh, I make it quickly. Um, number one, to 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 listen to these these voices of people of color. You can find it on Google. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on social media. Listen is number one. Um, I think that's one of the things that I have seen you demonstrate so well is amplifying voices of color, and you're just listening. Uh, number two, educating yourself, right? Finding the, the right books, the right documentaries, Cracking the Code, 13, Just Mercy, educating yourself, and then starting conversations and then taking action. For me, like, there's so much I want to do in the world, right? But I understand that Black Lives Matter are doing a great job of what they're doing, NAACP is doing what they do, and there's basketball foundations that are really doing great things, but rowing is my way, and for most of us that's a part of this call, it's the sport of rowing. And the sport of rowing must uh, reflect the diversity in this country and the diversity in its cities. And what does that take? That take volunteers, that takes money, right? That takes more resources to create this lighthouse in New York, right? To, 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 to make it happen, it, it costs so much money. Again, who said when they shut down the YMCA, I went to the streets. Four to 6 p.m. every day is where teenagers are getting in trouble, right? Is when there's risky behavior, and when they just sit and playing basketball, I mean, video games and not really learn at that time, parents are at work. But we are trying to create this lighthouse from four to six to give young people an opportunity to be loved, to experience uh, th this meditative sport for the first time, to fall in love with the water, to bring together people who normally wouldn't have said hi to each other on the subway, on the train, uh, uh, to create a, a movement of young people that's gonna continue this legacy. And so I will say the call to action is, is to, to listen, to learn, to give, to volunteer, and to ask Amanda and Row New York, what do you need and what do I do? Uh, my mom always said, um, if you see the need, meet the need. It was just that simple. And, um, and, and, and go get it and, and go for it. And, um, and so I'm going to demonstrate that for the rest of my life. I'm going to give myself away to this, this sport and, 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 and for people. And, uh, and I, I just hope that everyone can, can join me uh, in doing this and being brave and being honest and standing up against injustice. And, uh, and don't be afraid and don't fear. I think the last thing I'll have to say is, you know, there's a story of a coach who told his team, he said, I'm going to put this two by four on the ground. It's this slim. And I want you guys to catwalk on the two by four across to the other side. And very quickly and easily, all the, the teammates just went on the two by four and walked straight across to the other side. Then he took that same two by four and he put it on top of a ladder that was eight feet. He said, all right, same two by four, you easily walk past. It. Now I want you to walk, go on top of the ladder and walk past it and no one did. Fear happened, but it's the same, by, same two by four. What changed? The environment changed. Mm. We all know, and when we say to ourselves, or we'll say to our one black friend or the people that are close to us, that we understand that we walk this world differently than you do, that there is injustice, that you've been harassed, that you've been treated unfairly. But out in the open or in our social media, when the environment changed, that fear comes. Yeah. But you are the same person, you know? It's the same two by four, and you're the same person who is loving, is kind, to understand it, to see it, to listen, to educate yourself. But I ask you when the environment changed to stand up the same way and be yourself. And Kennedy said, each time a person stands up, they send forth a tiny ripple of hope. And with those ripple of hope, we sweep down the mighty walls of oppression. And so I hope that uh, everyone can take that walk with us. I hope so too, Arshe. <laughs> uh, now, as I, I want to hog myself because I just want to continue. 
just us, but um, that would be unfair to the many people who have tuned in who have questions. So this is my official notice to the Road New York tech team that we are ready for <laughs> other people besides me. Um, but thank you for that impassioned, um, beautiful, and and truly inspiring call to action um, for all of us. And I, I hope it, I hope and trust that it's landing on um, undefended hearts and open open minds. That's my my wish. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if we wanted questions, I was told they were going to. Aha! There we go. Our, what advice do you have for collegiate student athletes when addressing diversity on their rowing teams? How can we create change in the rowing world as collegiate student athletes? Yeah, I think um, there are many programs like Row New York, Chicago Training Center, uh, Reach High Baltimore, a lot of programs that are doing what Row New York is doing. and. My advice to you is instead of uh, spending your summer hanging out, go volunteer at those programs and meet those juniors, those sophomores and seniors that need the same opportunity that you got. How did you get to that college? What was your 2K score? What academic support do you have? How do we give and help them with those same opportunities and go to our coach and say, we need to diversify our team, that there are young people that need opportunities, right? They can't go to the same Stanford and Yale camp in the summer that a lot of these kids go to. Uh, they don't have some of the um, uh, um, triple digit uh, coaches in the high school that you had. Um, and um, I think that, but they're fast and they're strong and they're amazing. And we just need to put more resources into nice bowl houses and equipment and things like that. So I would say, use your time, come in the summer, get to know them and, 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 and work with them and teach them some of the things you learned and go to your coach and say, it's a must that they, be a part of our team and start recruiting all the kids from uh, Australia and Europe and, and, and the talent is in our country. It's here in the house, it's in our communities, and it's in our neighborhoods. I love that. Arshe, there are so many great moments with your teammates throughout the documentary. Are there any highlights from behind the scenes that are especially memorable? Oh. <laughs> hey, directors. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, God. You know, honestly, it, it it's, it was a lot of complaining. Like we, it hurt. We're 40 years old, you know, and they was getting us up at 5 a.m. I mean, at, so, at 40 degree weather and we were on that water and pulling and we were like mad. We were upset and, you know, and, you know, Preston will yell, we're the talent. Where's the heaters? I need the heaters for the talent. You know, we enjoy that. That was, it was hilarious, you know, and, you know, they had fruit and we were like, you know, we don't, where's the pancake? So just like being in that environment, having fun, but the practices were, um, were tough, but um, it doesn't show everything. But as you can see in the film, we start off rough, rough, but we, we redeveloped that chemistry again. And it was off the scene every day showing up at practice. And, uh, and I tell you, if you would ask the guys that, they will tell you the moment they enjoy most was yelling at the cops because they were late for practice. Ah. Uh, they, they just couldn't get right. And I remember Alvin yelling when they pulled up, the cops never show up and they always late, you know? And so, and they will laugh about it, you know, and, 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 and joke around about it. We spent a lot of time kind of roasting them and, and clowning them a little bit, but uh, those, were, those were fun moments. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what's happened to the other rowers on your boat since the July 19, uh, 2019 race? Um, the guys that were in the boat with me are the ones that didn't make it in the boat. Um, so since uh, 19, they're, they're just uh, still running their business. And, and it, it's cool, though, because a couple years ago, I was at a, a convention and someone said in the middle of my speech, how many of these guys went on to be Olympic rowers or national team rowers? I was like, none. But 90% of them are contributors, are entrepreneurs and contributors to their community. And that's what, they, that's what they're doing. That's what they're still doing. They're hiring people and, and uh, working with folks and getting their kids out to the boathouse and, and um, can just continuing the legacy that our coaches started so many years ago. Because that was Ken's original intention, wasn't it? Like it was a combination of, of he was coaching you guys in, in entrepreneurship. That's what he was. He yeah. Was yeah. So I think, you know, there's always, you know, there's, there's rowing, there's academic support. His idea was like entrepreneurship, 
you know, and he was big on that and um, and, and rowing, and so and being a great human, and uh, and those are the things that we took and learned and and used for the rest of our lives. Those lessons in the boat, how to use them outside of the boat, and and just building teams, and and followers and leaders. What advice would you have for black women who want to row? Bro, go out there, call me. I will teach you. I will work with you. It. You're so powerful, especially young black women. There are so many scholarship opportunities and and uh, on the college level, right? And it it, it and row New York will help you help you get there. Uh, but we need more black women rowing. And here's the thing, that I had to call out different entities in this sport. I have a group that I work with that are. are all black men and black women that row, and there's so many black women that row. So join our, join us, uh, in, in, in our Zoom. You can email me for uh, more information. But um, please row, be, do it. It's, it is awesome. It's meditative. You have a place in this sport uh, with Row New York, a place in the sport with uh, me. Uh, but please do it. I want to see your faces out there. And I saw you were on a podcast recently called Was it Diversity in Rowing? Oh, Rowing in Color. Growing color. Okay, yeah. I <laughs> it looks like other, there's resources out there. Yeah, there's resources out there. Yeah. Next question. Have you gotten to row the beautiful new Hudson single yet? No, I haven't. I am. Um, so Hudson reached. Uh, <laughs> uh, you got to, Liz. You have to see this boat. It's amazing. So they dedicated a boat to me uh, just for my work. And it has like the Manly Crew logo on it. It's red and black, the Manly colors. And I've never even been in a single. So um, I'm excited to, to get on it. Um, and they gave me this boat. And I was like, I am so glad you guys gave me a boat. But uh, can we give uh, boats to these organizations that need it? And they said, absolutely. I was like, good, let's work together. Appreciate <laughs> <laughs> enjoys his gift for exactly 11.6 seconds before turning the attention once more to the community at large. Yeah. <laughs> exactly who you are as a human being. <laughs> uh, do we have time for another question? Okay, question, could you share a little bit more about you and your teammates' experience training with Olympic coach? Mike Tatey. E. Yeah, you know, it's um best way to explain him it's almost like, so Michael Jordan said one time in an interview, they said, what makes you the greatest basketball player in the world? And he was like, oh, simple, just, you know, just put the ball in the hole. You know, take the ball, put the ball in the hole. That's, that's all you got to do. All right. And so Mike Tatey was that kind of person. I was like, yeah, we're going to get trained by the Olympic coach. We're going to learn all these different technical skills and it's going to be awesome. And we get in the boat and it's just like, uh, follow the person in front of you. Just <laughs> sit up. Lose the gut and you'll get there. So it was like, lose the gut, sit tall, follow the person in front of you. And that's what we did. <laughs> I'm really close to my 2020 New Year's resolutions that I haven't made. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I loved what you said um, in the movie, like, it's not that complicated. It's just rowing. You know, like, don't over. <laughs> It's just rowing, you know, and I was like, wow, I think that he that it would be a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah, because you get in your own head, you know, and, and and so, you know, and that's when we had the UFC uh, fighter Uriah Hall came out and talked about eliminating that doubt and that fear, you know, and, and um, yeah, it, it don't have to complicate it. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have another question for you, if I can throw it in. You're such yeah. a storyteller. This is this is a writerly question from what from one writer to another. Um, tell me about your experience of writing the book and getting the movie made um, in terms of bringing your story to I mean, this is a dream many people have to to share their stories in print and on screen. And you've actually done it. So, um, you know, was it was it easy? Was it hard? Was it? No, it was hard. I, I, I would I always said to myself, like, you know, I'm not a writer. I'm just a storyteller. Like there was a lot of doubt. And I've never taken a writing class, so I was like, but I know I need to write this story. And I write it, I, you know, I was writing poetry as a kid because my first job was cleaning toilets. So I would clean toilets and I would sit there and just write, you know, write, write for grace and write poems and stuff like that. And I remember when I wanted to write this book, I took a week off and when, and I just sat on YouTube all day listening to these workshops on how to write a memoir. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to read a lot of James Baldwin and at Tom Fisher and all these memoirs. So I did that. And I remember I said to myself, I'm ready to write. And my uh, 
Ken's ex-wife, Jenny, said, I have a book for you to read. And she gave me this book called The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion. And I'm, I'm on a New York train. I mean, being a black man reading that book in front of a lot of white women on the train, the people were like, oh, you know, you read some Joan Didion. And, but the way she paints a picture through her writing, like that moment in the living room with her husband, having a glass of wine, I, reading that book, I kind of was like, okay, reading James Baldwin, reading her and how people paint a picture, I know what I have to do. And so I just started storytelling, like every story and maybe on 60, 70 different pieces of paper. And then I just connected those stories and just made it poetic. And, and uh, it, was, it was hard because you say to yourself, you, these are moments you never want to relive again. And I had to relive those moments. And it was hard. I remember writing about my dad and slamming the laptop. And it, it, it was painful to write, but I kept thinking about the younger Malcolms and younger Arches and Alvins that are out there that just need the roadmap, you know, and just need a mentor in the roadmap. And and so I and I wanted to be completely honest because I know that they're going through the same things. And all I wanted was someone just to be honest with me. And um, and so that was that was um, the process of of writing, and it was beautiful. And the old, the I felt like Sugar Water, the um, the self published version, uh, which is all these random stories. It was for me. It was therapy. It was healing. And the new version is is for young people. And so that's uh, that's the story. And then connecting with Mary Mazio, who read the book. The, uh, tweeted out to me and I was like, let's work together. And because she's all about social change and, and making an impact. And, and so, um, yeah, it was fun. We got Com and Dwayne Wade and, and a lot of folks involved and, and, and that was exciting to make. Well, it's a beautiful piece of work. And um, I think if it's okay with everybody, can we take one more question from the audience? I, I don't, um, I want to make sure everybody gets uh, what advice do you have for black rowers who are starting or who have already started rowing as masters as opposed to people? No, oh, masters. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's it's learning, right? I think um, I, will, we, I, I love masters rowers, right? Um, I'm considered a masters rower now. Um, my advice is really just be you and invite your friends that look like you. I've with this group, I talked to a lot of black rowers who are the only ones in their boat in, on the college level. And there's a lot of folks that are the only one on the, uh, the high school level. But I am thankful for places like Row New York and my program that we had someone to lean on that was feeling the same thing that, that I felt, right? Or you felt. And, and so what I did in high school when you know some of the guys were dropping out or couldn't be a part of the team, or I started recruiting myself as a kid, people who looked like me, who I thought would be great in the boat. And I will tell you, your rowing experience is going to be good. But I challenge you to also get your friends to be a part of that team, because my mission is to bring brown people on the water. And when that happens, we begin to interact with people who don't look like us. And we be able to, and we're able to recreate, uh, create a beautiful reflection of, of the city we live in, and, uh, and and learn many more things from each other. So, do it, uh, do it with love, do it with passion, and invite others to experience the same thing that you're experiencing. Arshe Cooper, you are a national treasure. <laughs> I'm so happy that I finally got to meet you. I've I've admired your work for so many years, and I and you and I have intersected through New York and, and that both of us, um, I know I speak for both of us when I say that Row New York is an organization that um, we love, that we admire, that we would do anything for. Um, those of you who have joined us, watch the film, um, look into Row New York and, and, and help them because the service that they do is, is extraordinary for, um, for the community. And thank you all for joining. Um, Arshe, all the best to you. Um, I will always be your fan, whatever it is world. I'll always be watching, cheering, and hopefully participating. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Um, you know, and my wife has your books. So 
we got to get them signed at some point. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you, Amanda Kraus, Rachel, uh, Mio, and the whole staff at Row New York. Um, thank you for doing all that you do. And I understand with COVID um, that it's been rough, it's been hard. But as rowers, we are trained that when a crab happens, we let it pass or we sit tall and fight against it and we keep rowing with the punches. So um, let's do that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.